Hey everyone, I'm Miriam. We're going to be talking about process of labor and OB procedures. So it is bedside report time and we get a client who's a G3 P2 and she is 39 weeks. She's contracting every five minutes and it is our job to figure out, is this the real deal or is this false labor? What should you assess to determine if this is true labor or false labor? We want to look at two things and that's going to be contraction frequency and any cervical changes. And the NCLEX loves to test on this distinction. In false labor, uterine contractions are going to be irregular they're known as Braxton Hicks. These contractions will stop with rest and hydration. In true labor, our contractions are regular, like every five minutes, and they're going to intensify with time and activity, and nothing you do are going to make these go away. Now for that cervix. In false labor, we're going to see no cervical changes, no effacement, and no dilation. But in true labor, we're going to have progressive changes that are going to lead to dilation and our cervical effacement. I want you to think of that cervix like a donut. That hole in the center of the donut is going to get wider, and that's dilation. And that donut is going to get thinner and flatter, and that's effacement. If we've assessed this client and we've determined that she is not in true labor, then what exactly is happening? Well, she's probably just having Braxton Hicks contractions. Remember, those contractions are irregular, and it's just the body's way of getting ready for labor. So there's many signs that precede labor, and Braxton Hicks is one of them. Another one is going to be lightning or dropping. This is when that fetal head drops lower into the pelvis, and that's just to get ready for labor. So you might see this described on the NCLEX as as the client can suddenly breathe a little easier. And that's because that fetal weight is not pushing up on that diaphragm anymore. However, she might be having increased urinary frequency and that's because that fetal head is pushing down on that bladder. You might see increased vaginal discharge and that's just increased mucus production that's happening as that cervix is starting to soften. Now this might get described as bloody show and that is a pinkish brown tinged bloody discharge that happens and don't panic. This is normal pregnancy bleeding that happens at the end as that cervix starts to soften and thin or a face. And our last sign preceding labor is going to be this energy burst, or also called nesting. This is when the client gets a sudden burst of energy and she wants to clean her entire house. She is preparing for that baby's arrival. Now remember, none of these signs mean it's time for her to run and head to the hospital. It just means her body's getting ready and that baby's getting ready. All right, time for our first NCLEX quick check. What is the difference between true labor and Braxton Hicks contractions? Remember, true labor is going to cause contractions that are regular and increase in intensity and cause cervical changes. And Braxton Hicks contractions are irregular and they're not going to cause any cervical changes. In addition to Braxton Hicks contractions, what two signs precede labor that we can assess for? That's going to be lightning, which is that fetal head dropping lower into the pelvis, and bloody show, that pinkish brown tinge discharge that happens as that cervix softens. Now, while your client's in labor, we're going to be checking some specific things. So first, we need to determine that fetal position, and we're going to do that with Leopold's maneuver. We don't want a client to labor if that baby is breech or in a transverse position, right? Because those patients are going to have a C-section. So we're going to feel for that fetal back, which is going to feel long and smooth. And that's where that fetal monitor is going to go because it's the best place to hear that fetal heartbeat. Then we'll also feel on the opposite side and we'll notice some different irregular shapes, some lumps and bumps, and those are the arms and legs. Now, when that monitor's on, we can monitor that fetal heart rate. And remember, we want to see 110 to 160. That's the sweet spot. And of course, remember that that fetus is our patient too. So we're going to be watching that fetal heart rate because labor can cause fetal distress and we need to be able to act quickly. Now, once we found that fetal back and placed that external monitor on, we're going to be monitoring not just the fetal heart rate, but also the uterine contractions. So we'll monitor these for duration, frequency, frequency, and intensity. And I want you to remember this star point. We need strong, regular uterine contractions. Those are necessary to help that cervix dilate and push that fetus through the birth canal. As those contractions happen, they're going to push that fetal head further onto that cervix, and that weakened cervix is going to dilate from that pressure. And then also remember that we want to make sure to teach the client that she is going to push with contractions when it's time. Those contractions, remember, are going to help push that fetus down, and that's going to make it a little easier. As that client's laboring, we're going to be watching the contractions, the fetal heart rate, and we're also going to be watching for cervical changes. Now remember, the goal is to get to full dilation of 10 centimeters and full effacement, which is 100%. Now during these cervical exams, we're also going to be checking the fetal station. This is going to tell how far that presenting part is down in the pelvis. When we see a negative station, that means we're above the ischial spines. That fetal head is not engaged. When we're at zero station, remember this star point, that fetus is engaged. That's exactly where we want that fetus to be. It means that fetus is locked in and getting ready to exit. Now, if you see positive stations like plus one, plus two, that means we're below those ischial spines and we're getting closer to delivery. And at plus four station, delivery is imminent. Now, what can you do to help promote fetal descent? 
Well, one of the big things is remember this start point, we wanna ensure that bladder is empty. That's gonna help create more space for that fetus to pass through the birth canal. We also can encourage frequent position changes and use gravity to help pull that baby down. The last piece that we'll be monitoring is amniotic fluid. We'll be watching for rupture, and when that amniotic sac ruptures, we're gonna be monitoring taco, or time, amount, color, and odor. And make sure to report any amniotic fluid that is green tinged, which can mean we have meconium in the fluid, or if it's cloudy or foul odor, which can mean there's an infection. Okay, time for your next NCLEX quick check. Should the client push with or between uterine contractions? We want her to push with uterine contractions. Remember, those contractions are gonna help push that fetal head further into the pelvis and help with delivery. What fetal station indicates the fetal head is engaged? Remember, that's zero station. That means that fetus is in line with those ischial spines. Now, as your client labors, she's gonna move through four stages. Stage one is the longest, and this is gonna be where we have dilation and effacement. So remember, we want the client to rest, ambulate, hydrate, and we're gonna be managing pain. And remember this star point, it's really important to help her focus on her breathing techniques. Stage two is gonna be our delivery of the baby. So in this stage, we'll help with pushing and delivery. Stage three is gonna be delivery of that placenta. So here we wanna make sure that we are doing fundal assessments and monitoring for bleeding. And our last stage, stage four, is gonna be where we have recovery and stabilization. So we wanna make sure to assess that fundus, the lochia, and vital signs. We will also promote bonding with skin to skin and breastfeeding. Now you know that NCLEX loves to test on pain control. It is the fifth vital sign and uterine contractions are painful. Clients can use pharmacological, non-pharmacological, and a combination of the two. So we can teach the partner or we can help and give counter pressure. And this is firm pressure applied to the lower sacral area and it's gonna help with any back labor pain. We'll also make sure to help her with focused breathing to distract from any pain. So that's with slow, relaxed breathing, pattern breathing, or open glottis breathing when she's pushing. Open glottis is where they take a deep breath at the start of contractions and have a slow prolonged exhalation through pursed lips while pushing. This is gonna help keep that baby in position. Now for pharmacological, they can use systemic analgesics and that's things like opioids. Make sure to avoid administering opioids if the delivery is expected within four hours to prevent neonatal respiratory depression because opioids can sedate both mom and baby. Now, if you have to give them, make sure you notify the newborn delivery care team so they're ready for resuscitation. We can also give epidural anesthesia. Now with epidural, make sure that you preload that mom with 500 to 1,000 mLs of IV fluids. And this is to prevent the vasodilative effects of anesthesia that cause hypotension. So of course, we'll be monitoring for maternal hypotension or any late decelerations that the fetus might experience. And we wanna make sure we're assessing for pain relief and movement of those extremities. Time for your next NCLEX quick check. What is the focus in the first and fourth stage of labor? Remember, in that first stage, we want to work on breathing techniques. And in that fourth stage, we're assessing the fundus and bleeding and encourage bonding. Avoid opioids if delivery is expected in what time frame? That's four hours because of the newborn respiratory depression that it can cause. So make sure you alert that newborn delivery care team if any opioids have been given. What interventions should you take before epidural placement? Well, of course, we want to preload that mom with 500 to 1,000 mLs of IV fluids to prevent any vasodilative effects of anesthesia that cause hypotension. All right, let's switch gears to our OB procedures. Now these procedures are all things that could help with a successful and safe delivery. So first up is an amniotomy. This is to help induce or augment labor. This is when the provider is gonna break that bag of water. So remember this star point, we must confirm that that fetal head is engaged at zero or positive station. That fetal head acts like a cork on that cervix, so it's not gonna let anything slip by the head. If that baby is not engaged, you can have a cord prolapse where a cord slips past that head, and that's an emergency. We'll be monitoring fetal heart rate before and after an amniotomy. And of course, we wanna make sure we assess taco after that fluid rupture. So that's that time, amount, color, and odor of amniotic fluid. Now, some clients might have an induction of labor if they need to deliver early or if they haven't gone into labor on their own. We can do this by giving medications. So prostaglandins, these are used to promote cervical ripening and softening or that effacement. And then oxytocin, this is used to stimulate uterine contractions. And remember, oxytocin is gonna increase that strength and frequency of uterine contractions. So if it does too good of a job, it could cause uterine tachycystole, and we need to monitor for that. Uterine tachycystole is when we have over five contractions in 10 minutes, and this can cause fetal distress. So if this happens, you need to stop that oxytocin. Now, if your client's labor becomes prolonged or there's any fetal distress, the provider can assist with delivery with a vacuum or with forceps. 
The nurse's job is just to assist. So what can we do? We want to ensure that client's bladder is empty to maximize the pelvic space and prevent any injury. We're going to assess that mom for any perineal trauma that might have occurred from those delivery instruments. We'll be monitoring that newborn for head trauma that can happen and jaundice. So these instruments can cause bruising to that fetal head and trauma, and that's going to increase red blood cell breakdown, which can increase bilirubin and jaundice in these babies. Let's say your client's laboring and that head gets kind of stuck. The provider might need to create a little extra room, and that's with an episiotomy. This is a surgical vaginal opening that's going to allow a little extra space for that head to exit. Now, this is going to cause a lot of bruising and swelling for that mom. So we want to provide perineal care, like some ice packs. And of course, we'll be assessing for healing and any signs of infection. All right, time for your next NCLEX quick check. What should be assessed when membrane structure? Remember, that's gonna be TACO, our time, amount, color, and odor of amniotic fluid. How frequent are contractions with uterine tachycystole? Well, remember, that's over five uterine contractions in 10 minutes. What should you do if your client receiving oxytocin experiences uterine tachycystole? Remember, we're gonna stop that oxytocin. All right, let's do a quick wrap up. True labor changes the cervix, false labor doesn't. We'll be watching for lightning and bloody show as that's the baby's warm up act. OB procedures come with risks, right? So we wanna know your safety checks. Make sure that that fetal head is at zero station before an amniotomy and assess TACO. And stop oxytocin for any uterine tachycystole. Okay, you're ready for process of labor and obstetrical procedures on the NCLEX.